All right, well, let's get started. Um, let me open us in a word of prayer and then uh, we'll dive into today's lesson. So Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this time together. Thank you for the ability to uh, meet virtually. And I just pray that you would be with us each wherever we are. Bless this time together. Uh, help me as I teach this lesson to uh, really show the, the full beauty of the, of the narrative of the Old Testament. Um, as it heads into uh, into the promise, into the promised land, and, and foreshadowing the coming of Jesus and, and the New Testament. Uh, so I pray all this in your name. Amen. Okay. Let's get started. Screen sharing all right? Good. All right, so as usual, we'll start with a bit of uh, context and review, because we're operating at such a 50,000 foot perspective. I think it's easy to kind of get lost in, uh, in where we're overall headed. So um, the first half of Dan and I's Sunday school class, we were focusing on that concept of following Jesus in the wilderness through the season of Lent. Uh, and we were paralleling Jesus's time in the wilderness with Israel's time in the wilderness and seeing again how uh, Jesus succeeded where Israel failed and uh, sort of in a devotional sense contemplating our own invitation to journey with Jesus into the wilderness and now we've entered the second half during the season of Eastertide um, and we're bringing that narrative into the fulfillment and promises of scripture and once again, sort of paralleling Israel and Jesus. Um, however, we've broken this one up half and half, focusing on Israel in the Old Testament here in these first couple weeks. And then after this, Dan is taking uh, Dan is taking it for the New Testament. And so we're focusing on, in these first couple of weeks, kind of the tension set forward as Israel enters into the Promised Land, where we see both fulfillment of the promises laid out but also some key tension points pointing towards a greater fulfillment. And then uh, in the next couple lessons, Dan is going to be talking about how Jesus sets himself up as the fulfillment to those tensions and invites us to partner with him uh, in this new kingdom, in this new exodus, uh, and how we become then part of this great fulfillment of the promises laid out all the way all the way back to Abraham. So uh, last week we left off with Israel in the plains of Moab, ready to ready to enter the promised land. Uh, just a quick word about the, the picture on the right. I was trying to find a good picture that was taken from the Arava Valley where the Jordan River is looking uh, to the west rather than to the east where we're looking towards Moab but to the West looking into the promised land. This was kind of the best thing I could come up with. It's not the best, but it lays out a pretty nice, this is actually at uh, the Qumran, the site of Qumran, uh, which from the standpoint of where I was taking the picture would have been behind me. And this was us heading up for a day of exploration up into the cliffs to, to look at the caves. But that's just the perspective point that I wanted to show. We're in the Arava Valley. We're looking West at the cliffs that as you go up into them would have uh, led you up into the central hill country towards Jerusalem and towards the promised land. So this would have been more or less roughly off by 15 miles or so uh, where Israel's perspective would have been looking um, west into the promised land. But here they are uh, encamped uh, in the Arava Valley. And what are their expectations? We talk, kind of talked about this last week, but uh, God had spoken to Israel about how this would be a land flowing with milk and honey, the fat and the sweetener of the basic diet at that time. And this would be a land of plenty. It would be a land of peace, uh, of, of peace and prosperity. This would be a land where God and his people would be together in right relationship uh, with the proper temple worship um, and that uh, proper Sinai covenant being lived out. Uh, God and his people would be together in, in right relationship and that blessing that was promised to Abraham, that this would be a blessed people that would also be a blessing to the nations around them. 
um, that Israel would see these expectations, or Israel would see this fulfillment to these expectations laid out to uh, the promises of, uh, to, given to Moses and to Abraham. So this would have been a really exciting time as they're looking west and contemplating what uh, God's plan for, for his people would look like. And real briefly, I want to go back to that concept of this sort of being a return to Eden. I know this wasn't what their expectation was entirely. If we're going back to the literal Eden, no, but that sort of metaphor of what Eden was, was that it was the overlap between God and his people. And we really see the Edenic imagery in the tabernacle. This is just the artistic rendering of the tabernacle in the, from the ESV study Bible, but it's a good one. Um, but both in the tabernacle and in the temple of Solomon, uh, the imagery that filled there uh, was full of figs and grapes and pomegranates and the menorah tree was made to look like a tree. Um, and you have the temple curtain with the, with the cherubim and seraphim and the seat of mercy. This was sort of the throne room of God with a lot of Eden-like imagery. Uh, and so it was a point of blessing from which Israel would be blessed and there have that, that uh, opportunity to be in relationship with God through the ministry of the, of the priests and the temple worship. And so once again, that's that overlap point between heaven and earth, where heaven and earth come together and um, God and his people can, can be together. Uh, so again, Israel has the tabernacle and they're going to enter into the promised land and set up eventually uh, the temple in Jerusalem. And so you've got God's holy city, the sort of epicenter of God's place on earth and his point from which the blessings go out to his people. And then from there to uh, the ends of the earth. So these are all the, the sort of, um, yeah, the expectations and the uh, ideas set forth of what ideally things uh, could have been like. But of course, then we have to enter into uh, what actually happened as Israel enters into the promised land. So here they have, we have them at this point of going through that long journey in the wilderness with God. And now God is leading them into the promised land to inherit these promises. And aspects are going to be fulfilled, but aspects are going to leave us in tension, longing for uh, something else. So how are we going to see that actually worked out in, in scripture as they enter into the promised land? Um, so first of all, we're going to talk about Joshua and Judges, but Joshua itself, the structure of the book, and this is really kind of uh, an interesting attestation to Joshua's genuine and authentic antiquity, is that the format of the book is laid out like an ancient Near Eastern victory account. On the right, I have pictured there uh, the Merneptah stele, and that's probably one you've heard of. That's a particularly famous stele because it is uh, the first, the, the oldest recording of the land of Israel, the people of Israel outside of the biblical text. Uh, so the Merneptah stele dates to approximately 1200 BC in which Pharaoh Merneptah relays in his own ancient and Eastern victory account, uh, his foray into Israel, conquering various lands. And in there he mentions Israel. It's just a brief mention, but it is so important as archeological evidence for ancient Israel because it shows that this isn't, you know, um, a late invention of the of the Hellenistic Jews trying to create some history for themselves. This is a real people group that existed in antiquity, and because the Merneptah stele can be accurately dated, we have evidence of Israel existing to 1200 BC. So Merneptah stele, very famous. You've probably heard of it in a lot of your Old Testament survey classes, but always good to have a, a review of that. Um, Joshua similarly is laid out, uh, starts with the major victories and miraculous interceptions. Ancient Eastern, of course, would be by the gods, by the, by the divine assembly, such as that particular nation has it, followed by the list of lands and peoples that were acquired by that particular uh, military campaign. Joshua, however, has some significant differences from other ancient Near Eastern victory accounts. In particular, Joshua also records Israel's defeats and failures. And also at the end of the book of Joshua and the beginning of the book of Judges, 
there is a long account of all of the various cities and people groups that Israel actually failed to conquer and did not actually conquer. Uh, you know, when in the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, when it talks about the land promised to Israel, generously you get this wide swath from the Nile Delta to the Euphrates River. Almost never is that really seen, except for maybe you could say during the reign of Solomon, he had influence uh, that might have gone that far. But other than that, especially right after Joshua and Judges, Israel is really focused in the central hill country. Uh, and so you don't see this, this wide spread of uh, their influence. And that's going to have impact on Israel, as we shall see here shortly. As we go into the book of Judges, and if you would go ahead and turn to that passage, I'm going to briefly read over some parts of that and point out some important pieces. Uh, but this is, the, this is the downside, right? We're all familiar with the big stories at the beginning of Joshua, uh, the story of Jericho and I and Joshua's defeating of the various kings of the land. Um, th we like to focus on the successful parts. Uh, and you read over, you didn't, maybe don't get so far as to the end of Joshua or the beginning of the book of Judges and see um, the parts in which Israel failed to conquer aspects of, uh, of what they were sent out to do. So this is where you really get uh, the parts where Israel failed to completely get the full land. I'm not going to read over all of this, but as you look in your Bibles, starting in Judges chapter 1, verses 27, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beit She'an and its villages, etc., etc., etc. Verses 29, Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer, just want to emphasize that because that's where uh, Lydia and I excavated and uh, many others of our friends. Um, Zebulon did not drive out the inhabitants of Ketron, verse 30, and then verse 31. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you get the idea. This is the list. That's why I'm not going through all of it to, to bore you to death. But the various tribes of Israel and all of the various cities um, that they do not drive out. Uh, Akko, Gezer, Beit She'an, uh, Tanakh, uh, Dor, Megiddo, just highlighting some major cities that will come up in our maps later in the, in the presentation. Uh, but these big and important, impressive, well-fortified cities uh, that Israel is not able to drive out the inhabitants of the land. And chapter two of Judges is going to say that this was a failure of Israel. So I'll go ahead and read this passage, uh, starting in verse one of chapter two. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. You shall break down their altars but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your side and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept and they called the name of that place Bochim and they sacrificed there to the Lord. So whatever happened, the text here is saying this was a failure of Israel to fully trust in God and to fully follow his instructions. And therefore, you have a mixing then of the Canaanites and the people of Israel that God then says is going to be a thorn in their side. And then we see that, so that ends up being the introduction to the book of Judges, right? And then as we go through the story of the book of Judges, we see the judges cycle manifest, where you can see there in the picture, um, where Israel serves the Lord, then they rebel, then God raises up uh, uh, punishments and other uh, nations to come up against them. They cry out to the Lord, God gives them a judge, and Israel is delivered. And so you have this cycle that repeats itself over and over and over again throughout the book of Judges. And one of the key themes then in the book of Judges is that in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. 
an interesting side note because uh, Israel in one sense is not supposed to have a king. God is supposed to be their king. But Judges sets up this idea that Israel without clear direction, without a good and godly leader, is constantly prone to self-sabotage and failure as they go time and time again uh, into the cycle and God has to uh, redeem them and rise up, raise up a deliverer, raise up a judge, um, and restore uh, things to right relationship again. Um, and we see how the neighbors of Israel then become a thorn and a problem in the side of Israel as they, as Israel begins worshiping uh, the other gods, worshiping the Asherahs and the Baal and the other fertility cults of uh, of the Canaanites. Um, so you can see how already we're, we're sort of let down as you read through the story and you're there with Israel on the plains of Moab, excited about going into that promised land, going into uh, the promises that God has given to Moses and to Abraham. Uh, but then now as we continue reading through the text, it's a letdown. What has, what has happened? We are going to do at this point a slight archaeological interlude here to talk about uh, kind of the archaeological evidence uh, from this same time frame and see how, to some extent, we actually see this conflict in cultures working out in the actual material culture of the land of the Levant. Um, a brief overview of some of the nomenclature, some of the words that we're going to be using here, late Bronze Age and the Iron Age, you can see uh, the various Peter periods, sorry, um, and their corresponding dates. Uh, yeah, um, these are uh, the conventional archaeological dating system. There are various different debates and sometimes the nuances of when exactly to draw the line between these periods conflicts. Uh, but I'm going to be talking a lot about, in particular, the Late Bronze Age and the Iron One period, basically the early Iron Age period, and how Iron Age culture and Late Bronze Age culture has this period of overlap that is quite significant for understanding the context of the biblical period. So first of all, to set our context, let's talk about what the Late Bronze Age looked like uh, in the land of Canaan, um, what will become the land of Israel, a politically neutral term that we often use is the Levant. When you're not wanting to talk about a particular people group, you call this the Levant, which literally just means the land bridge um, between the continents. Uh, so the Late Bronze Age period, really the Late Bronze Age period was an incredible period of uh, prosperity. Um, a lot of big empires, you have uh, strong nations over in Mesopotamia, over in the Aegean area, and Egypt in particular, their influence extends far up into the Levant. Um, and they are the power uh, to reckon with at this time. However, throughout the period of the late Bronze Age time frame, we see the, the gradual reduction in Egyptian power. Uh, and they seem to be gradually receding. And then at the end of the Late Bronze Age, we have what's called the Late Bronze Age Collapse, which I'll talk about in a moment. But um, the cities that you see there marked on the map are uh, cities mentioned in the El Amarna letters. Um, the El Amarna letters or the El Amarna tablets uh, were these various clay cuneiform tablets that were found in an, in an Egyptian site called El Amarna. And they were various letters from the various city-state kings asking for and appealing for Egypt's help in these various regional skirmishes. But what these letters show in the geopolitical reality of this time was that you have these various city-states that were relatively autonomous, had their own kings, had their own governing systems, but were still dominated by the foreign power of Egypt. And Egypt was seen as um, the, the peace broker this time. This, this period is often called the, the Pax Egyptica. Uh, you've probably heard of the Pax Romana, but way back when you had the Pax Egyptica, where Egypt's uh, overall powerhouse created a, a period of peace and prosperity uh, in the late Bronze Age period, which is seen uh, in the material culture and the pottery. It was, uh, it was very beautiful. 
Um, this is classic late Bronze Age pottery. You can see the, the painting on there, the red, white, and blue glaze. Uh, they were not patriotic Americans. These were ancient late Bronze Age Canaanites. Uh, but a lot of these uh, were imports uh, from, from Cyprus. There's Cypriot pottery. There's pottery coming from the Aegean. There's pottery coming from Egypt. And all these material culture things are overlapping in the Levant in these city-states. Uh, so this is the Eye of Horus, uh, Eye of Horus uh, material cultural piece that we found at, at Egypt. And I'm just showing these some examples of the overall, uh, how should I say this? The economic prosperity and the overlapping cultures that we see in the late Bronze Age. There was an incredible trade system going on um, and relative uh, peace and prosperity. A lot of cities did not have uh, city walls because of this period of peace. But then at the end of the late Bronze Age, we have what's called the late Bronze Age collapse. We don't know exactly what caused it. There's various different theories. We won't go into it today. But the reason we know about this collapse from the material culture and the archaeological record so you have all these people groups that are being displaced and their material culture can be traced archeologically uh, through these various different sites and we can see a bit of their migration. This particular picture that you're seeing now is uh, from a wall relief at Medinet Habu, again from Egypt. And it depicts, it depicts the victory of Ramses III over the Sea Peoples. Uh, so in the very center, you see the Egyptian with the classic Egyptian headdress. And then in front of him and behind him, uh, various sea peoples with their feathery headdresses and their arms bound, uh, showing that the, that the Egyptians are taking them away in victory and it's slavery, enslaving the Philistines. It's an ironic victory stele because actually what happens is these sea peoples begin to settle on the coasts of the Levant. And I'm, I'm using the word sea peoples because it was a range of various different groups that came from the Aegean areas. But the most famous group that you will know very well as good Bible scholars is of course the Philistines, which was a part of these sea peoples. And they settled on the coastal points of the Levant. And I say it's ironic that Egypt depicts this as a victory because really in a lot of ways, this was a great loss to Egypt because once the Philistines settled there in the coastal plains of the Levant, they effectively cut off Egypt from uh, the larger control of the larger area of the Levant and forced Egypt to stay more confined to their historic grounds in the Nile Delta and the Nile Valley. Um, now Egypt continues to hold some control, but again, we see through the end of the late Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age, fewer and fewer Egyptian sites and Egyptian material culture uh, in the Levant as we go through the uh, history of that time frame. So this sets us up for the beginning of the Iron Age. This is a classic map from uh, Ensign Rainey's The Sacred Bridge. Uh, give my citation there, my academic citation. And it's a mess. Um, there are, there is an endurance of Egyptian material culture and Canaanite late Bronze Age material culture in some of these cities but then there's this other interesting phenomenon that I'm going to talk about that we see in the, uh, in the orange area of these early Iron Age settlements coming in um, archaeologically. Uh, unfortunately, it would be nice from an archaeological perspective if there had been a, a herald that went out to every city and said, okay, we now have the end of the Late Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron One. Everybody change your material culture and stop using these pots and start using these pots. And that would really help us in dating everything. Unfortunately, they didn't do that. And so you have this messy period known as the, of, as the early Iron Age, where we see a continuity of late Bronze Age Canaanite material culture, but then this new um, curious uh, Iron Age pottery that's uh, more utilitarian, it's clunky, it's not very pretty, um, and these new settlements. So let's talk about the new settlements. Relatively about the same time, say same time as best as we can understand that archaeologically, you have these new settlements, these new sites that start popping up all over the place. And they start in the east on the Transjordan and work their way across the valley into the central hill country uh, and begin popping up all over the place. 
and they're typically very, very small and insignificant, and they have uh, a particularly interesting shape. Most of them have a similar layout to uh, this particular plan that you see here. So this is just an example from one site, it's Betsarta. Um, but essentially, it's a small ring where you have uh, various different uh, small rooms where the outside wall forms the uh, outside wall of the city, generally just one entrance point and a large empty area in the middle. Uh, here's just another example from the Genian Desert of another site that looks somewhat similar. So basic short ring, one entry point in and out, and a large empty middle courtyard. Uh, so the question is, what, what are these sites um, that suddenly appear? One theory is that this particular site architecture would be the kind of settlements that you would expect from a nomadic people group. Uh, because oftentimes, if you are a nomadic people group using tents to dwell in, they'll set the tents up in a circle and use the circle as a kind of corral in which you can bring your livestock and such at night uh, to hopefully keep them safe from predators uh, and various pro other problems of the, of the wilderness and the desert. And so it seems like we have these settlements growing, popping up all over in the early Iron Age, of a nomadic people group that is settling down and creating more permanent structures. Rather than living in tents, they're now creating villages and homes. Um, and so, you again, this curious phenomenon, what is this, this people group sites in the, in the east headed into the west, virtually um, very, very similar material culture, similar town plan? Well, of course, this raises the question, could this be ancient Israel? Now, in one sense, I want to be careful here because we don't want to create a strict equivalency. This could be a number of different people groups that were upset and by the collapse of the late Bronze Age. People groups were moving around all over the place, and the idea of nomadic people groups settling down in this area is not inconceivable, and there's not like necessarily a uh, plaque at each one of these sites that says, this is a site, a settlement of ancient Israel. Uh, however, I have one, one of my professors once said, if it, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck and sounds like a duck, it's probably a, probably a duck. So it's possible that, and likely that in my opinion, that we're looking at ancient Israel settling into the promised land. Should say by way of a quick caveat that there is some controversy here too between the dating of the arrival of ancient Israel because as we saw at the beginning of these slides, the Iron Age begins at about 1200 BC, and that's when you see these sites and the Merneptah Stele talking about Israel being in the land of the Levant. Um, however, uh, there's, a, there's a controversy a bit between late date and early date uh, theories of when exactly the Exodus took place. We don't have time to get into uh, the various reasons for those different debates. I just want to acknowledge that out there because I know I've got a sophisticated audience that some of you will be thinking, wait a second, that's a bit late for Israel's entrance into uh, the promised land. That's correct by the, by the early date uh, system. Israel should be coming into the promised land a couple centuries earlier. Uh, however, a lot of the late date people are looking at the archeological evidence and saying, but it looks like we've got ancient Israel here at about 1200 BC. Um, and so I just wanna share that with you as kind of an exciting side note of um, sort of a confirmation of the biblical story uh, and really some exciting possibilities that still have to be fully fleshed out archaeologically and uh, more and more is coming up every year of new discoveries that uh, give us a better overall picture of the transitions and the overall um, people group transitions that are happening at this time. Um, but I think I think we've got early Israel, that's my opinion, and I think there it is, these sites of uh, nomadic people groups settling down and creating permanent uh, establishments. Another brief thing on, on, the, on the concept of them going east to the west, the Pentateuch also talks about uh, you know, that half tribe of, of Manasseh wanting to settle down in the Transjordan first. 
that Israel starts settling down in the east before they move across the Jordan uh, into the promised land. So again, you've got this progression of these sites popping up uh, from the east to the west. All right, enough about that though. But overall, as we look at the early Iron Age period in the archeological record, and uh, here we've got uh, Ensign Rainey kind of overlapping archeology span and textual evidence, because in the orange areas there, the area of early Iron Age settlements, he's got the various different uh, tribes written down there, as this is sort of the settlement area of the early Israelites. But then those, cities with the lines over and above them are Canaanite cities that are left not conquered that are talked about in Judges 1. Uh, so there we see Gezer, Megiddo, Tanakh, Beit She'an. Uh, you recognize those cities from the passage in Judges that talked about the cities that were left unconquered by Israel. And coincidentally, we see in those cities a continuity of late Bronze Age material culture and Egyptian influence in a lot of them. Uh, and the reason this is important is this really shows you what a mess <laughs> the land was at this time and how Israel really had, as, as the scripture says there in, in Judges 2, that thorn in their side of these other people groups that really their material culture and their wealth are really appealing. So picture the juxtaposition here between Israel, this nomadic people group with their very modest dwellings that we looked at versus big cities like Megiddo or Gezer or Beit She'an uh, that are these large fortified cities with rich material culture, um, rich heritage, rich culture. And you could see how uh, the prosperity of some of these cities would be a temptation then to the Israelites well, maybe if we start uh, using some of their religious practices and start uh, taking on some of the characteristics of the Canaanite fertility cults, maybe then we will be as prosperous as these, uh, as these Canaanite city-states are. But of course, that is exactly against all of the uh, statutes and commandments that God gives to Israel in their time in the, in the wilderness. Um, so now, as we kind of wrap up, I want to go back into this concept of the tension and resolution that I talked about last week. So once again, just for review, uh, the analogy that I like to use is this concept of, of music, of tension and resolution. But if you have a really great symphony, and unfortunately, I'm not as much of a music scholar as I'd like to be, but I know this concept kind of exists, that uh, you have in music theory this ability to create a dialogue between tension and resolution of, of various chords that lead you to the other chords that lead you to other chords that lead you to um, resolving chords. And a great symphony will be this constant dialogue back and forth of tension and resolution. Uh, and if you can hear it, it's a very beautiful thing um, that brings together a full story in a great and beautiful way. And I, and I think this sort of music approach is kind of an interesting way of looking at the various cycles through tension and resolution that we see in the Old Testament leading to and pointing towards something bigger uh, and something greater. So again, here in this particular moment, we have Israel leaving the plains of Moab, going out and conquering the promised land. Uh, and in one sense, we see certain resolving chords to the tensions of the wilderness that Israel is indeed back in the land of Abraham. Uh, the covenant of Sinai that they were being prepared for in the wilderness is now in, in full effect. Um, and Israel is positioned now to be God's blessed people called to be a blessing to the nations. But then there are these cacophonous chords and, and tension chords that get introduced that expectation and reality doesn't exactly work out. So whereas they have this expectation going into the promise, that it's gonna be a land of, of peace and plenty flowing with milk and honey. But as we see worked out through the book of Judges, that there, is, there are these series of conflicts and famines and difficulties with Israel in the land as they continue to rebel from God and his plan. Uh, there is the expectation 
as they enter into the promised land that God and his people are together now in right relationship. The tabernacle has been established. Eventually, Jerusalem and a temple will be established. And right worship of God can be established through the temple practices. Uh, but in reality, Israel continues to rebel against God and, and follows into uh, worshiping the Canaanite fertility cults of their neighbors. Then there is the expectation that Israel is to be this blessed people that is going to be a blessing to the nations around them. But in reality, Judges is mostly a kind of a navel-gazing book that is mostly talking about Israel's failures and Israel's problems and how really the influence is not going out from Israel like it's supposed to, but it's actually coming into Israel with, again, them falling into the traps of worshiping the fertility cults of the, of the nations around them. Um, so here we have uh, just one example back here. This is just one example, really, of these various sort of musical themes, musical stories that are going through the Old Testament that create these cycles of, of tension and resolution. So whether it's the land and the promised land that we've been talking about, the people of God and their relationship with God, um, the tension around proper temple worship, or another you know, really interesting sort of theme through scripture uh, is this coming righteous king. Um, we read not too long ago in, in the morning prayer lectionary, the story of, of Balaam and Balak. And Balaam uh, at one point talks about that he sees a scepter coming out of Judah, that there is this coming righteous king um, that's promised to the people of Judah. It doesn't say much about him, but just there's a, there's a coming king on the horizon. So there's all these sort of strands, like a great symphony, where you sort of get these chords that seem to bring resolution, but also kind of lead you forward into, um, into the next chord, and then into the next chord, and then into the next chord. And um, at no point in the Old Testament do you get that final big crescendo and resolution. Every time you see God gives a promise, and then there's a fulfillment of that promise, but that fulfillment never quite brings to full fruition that musical dialogue, if you will. Um, and I, I think a particularly big one, a uh, theme in the Old Testament, is the overall story of the exile. And that would have to be a whole other lesson, a whole other series in Sunday school classes of how that sort of musical theme works its way out through scripture. But the overall tension of, of Israel's failure with the Mosaic covenant, the period of exile, and then God's uh, promised restoration after the exile and establishment of a new covenant. And yet, when Israel comes back in the land in Ezra and Nehemiah, we see partial fulfillment, but yet an expectation that's not fully realized. And I really think, you know, we often talk about the, the theme of already, not yet, as a New Testament concept. But I really think you can see that work out and even begun here in the Old Testament, that already we see the promises of God being fulfilled, but not yet do we see um, the full fulfillment of those. So a few of my concluding observations, and then I'll um, pause uh, for comments from you all uh, before I go into application points. Uh, but again, in review, as we're journeying with Israel into the promised land, the core tension I see laid out here is that humanity continues to fail and rebel from God's plan, not fully living out uh, God's instruction, God's instructions to his people. But God continues his plan to salvation and both redeems humanity and points forward to a greater resolution. And I think we see that even in Israel's coming into the promised land, that we see God's faithfulness in bringing them through that period in the wilderness, bringing them into the promised land, and seeing the fulfillment to his promises. But yet, as we've seen here, it didn't all work out exactly how we would have thought, and leads us with expectation to a greater resolution in the future. And throughout the Old Testament, we see these numerous loops, like the judges cycle loops, where God's people fail, uh, 
but God shows himself faithful and points us forward towards a, a greater resolution. And then what we're going to see here in the, in the weeks coming is how Jesus, through his teachings and actions, is going to show himself to be the fulfillment of these Old Testament tensions and resolutions, and how Jesus then um, is the true Israel. And we already talked about that in the first half of Jesus paralleling Israel through the wilderness. But now even as you know, his life story crescendos with his death and resurrection, we see him bringing um, all of Israel's story really with that you know, final tense chord of, of Good Friday to the full resolving chord of, of Easter Sunday. Um, and then the rest of the New Testament is showing how that resolving chord works itself out and how we are invited into the melody participating with God in, in, in his redemption. And so I think getting into the particulars of that will be Dan in the weeks to come. Uh, but before I go into a couple concluding points, I wanna pause here for uh, any other uh, concluding observations regarding the overall story of intention of God's um, journey with Israel through the wilderness into the promised land and the, um, the inability to uh, fully realize that expectation. So uh, you agree with me, you, have, you can test with anything. You, uh, do you have any other ways in which you see uh, a tension here between the resolution and the fulfillment? We'll pause for comment. And any questions about the archaeology? I know I just gave you like a huge crash course in late Bronze Age and Iron Age archaeology. All right, no, no questions. All right, let me bring a few points of application, I think, that we can just reflect on that I've been reflecting on in preparation for this, and I think it can lead forwards to the next couple of weeks, there'll be more application points and relevance for us as New Testament believers post-Jesus. But um, one big application point from the heart of an Old Testament guy is that there is real value in reading the Old Testament, uh, because in the full composition of God's full musical symphony here, uh, one really needs to feel the tension set up in these Old Testament stories to fully appreciate how Jesus becomes that great resolving chord to the melody. Um, and I really think you almost, you almost are going to miss it if you focus so much on the New Testament. Or another, I think, mistake that often gets made in the church is uh, just looking at the Old Testament is sort of a piecemeal buffet that you can say, see, God, Jesus fulfilled this prophecy, Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. And you don't really look at the full breadth of the story that really the New Testament authors are going to assume that you are fully familiar with and know intimately the Old Testament. And so when they briefly reference something in the Old Testament, they're not just proof texting, they're scripture linking to an overall narrative, meta narrative, and theme going on in, in the Old Testament. So I think one challenge is just to see that there's great value in really wrestling with the Old Testament. And it is a wrestle that is confusing and cumbersome. And um, I mean, we didn't even get into all the, the difficulties of the first part of, of Joshua and the commandments of God there. I mean, there's, there's a lot to wrestle with, and, and I get that. But there's great value for doing that. Uh, application point number two is to remember the story of God's faithfulness to restore and redeem his people. Man, that is such a huge part of the Old Testament. If, if you do go through the Old Testament, wherever Israel is commanded to remember uh, the story of ancient Israel, especially the story of the Exodus and God's promises, it's, it's a good idea to kind of underline that and see how often Israel is commanded, don't forget what God has done for you. Don't forget God's faithfulness uh, to his people. Because the remembering of that story gives Israel perspective in its present moment. Uh, we often use the, the sort of trite saying that the Old Testament shows us, and the Bible as a whole, shows us this whole story of um, 
Israel as peoples, as the people of God, has have a, a past with a meaning, a present with a purpose, and a future with a hope. And that that theme of past, present, and future is seen throughout the Old Testament, that God has, in Israel's past, given them a story that isn't just arbitrary and chaotic and meaningless, but it has a purpose and a meaning to it and can be seen, which shows Israel that in their present moment, whatever their present difficulty is, they have a purpose in that moment to live out the commands of God. But it also gives them whatever their present moment is and their difficulty, a future with a hope that God is not just arbitrarily uh, playing around with history, but that he has a plan uh, for our present epidemics. Um, so then that also leads us to this idea that know that there is a hope in the midst of the chaos, that God is in control of this big symphony, and we don't always know where it's going, uh, but the story of scripture shows that whatever the present circumstance of sort of the evil working itself out through the fall of humanity or what have you, uh, that God brings resolution and redemption to this time and time again. So God has a plan uh, to work out his salvation uh, in spite of us. So I just want to leave you there.